Hello everyone and a very good evening to you and you're welcome to another live stream where I'll be sharing with you lots of driving test tips, advice. I'll be going through this driving report sheet. I'll be explaining these signs but hopefully you'll have a go at um, giving an attempt at what these signs mean. There's a photograph on screen here of a junction um, where the learner sent me this photograph uh, because he had a question about the way he was marking on the driving test for going left so I'm going to explain that once I get into the report sheet. Um, I'll be giving you some updates now very soon and if you enjoy this live stream if you like these videos don't forget to hit that like button and you can also hit that subscribe button and click on the bell notification as well so you'll be notified whenever I make new content. My PayPal uh, links will be in the description if you would like to make a voluntary donation any help is much appreciated. Um, if you want to book your driving test, you do that on the My Road Safety portal, www.myroadsafety.ie, or you can access it through the RSA website. Anything to do with licenses, your learner permits, your full license, ndls.ie, as you can see there. Theory tests should be booked uh, on www.theorytest.ie. And if you have any questions um, you want to give to me, or you want to ask me any questions, or if you'd like me to analyze your report sheet, you can email me dayandtai at gmail.com. I only analyze report sheets in the live streams from people who give me proper feedback. Um, if you just send me your, your report sheet and you don't give me any information about what the tester said, about what you went what went wrong, it has zero chance of being featured here, okay? So if you want me to provide you with the best possible feedback, well then you're going to have to share some information with me because although I do have many talents, mind reading is not one of them. Okay, at least not yet. Um, so that's the intro. I'm going to go on to some updates now very soon. Let's see any comments in there. Uh, Wojciech, Dobre Vietur, Wojciech, Yaktam. You'll know what that means. Wojciech is one of the regulars here, so good to have you, Wojciech. You've been missing a few weeks, and you've turned up late a few times as well. So a few other people were saying to me, like, what's what's happened to you, you know? So good to have you there, Wojciech. Okay, so let's get on to some... Um, just updates uh, that I want to share with you about the driving tests and about driving in general. So first of all, for anybody up in Dublin on the north side, there is a new test centre in Finglas. Now there has been some issues with finding this. I think there's an issue with the error code. The error code people type in is not necessarily bringing, bringing them to the correct location or some kind of confusion. So the new Finglas test centre is Unit 9 Century Business Park Charlestown, Dublin 11. Okay, I'll say that again. Unit 9, Century Business Park, Charlestown, Dublin 11. Okay, so that's the new Finglas Test Centre. And there are new test centres opening up. There's one in Tolker in Cork, which opened up recently, and a few others around the country as more testers are being employed as a way of trying to reduce the waiting list. Okay, so updates from the RSA. Don't call the RSA over the phone okay their agents cannot deal with your queries uh, they are not able to they don't have the manpower at the moment they want you to deal with your driving test application in terms of applying for it and managing it on the my road safety portal okay www.myroadsafety.ie you'll be able to log in there with your mygov account and you'll be able to reschedule your test book your test and do lots of other things as well so check that out if you want to apply for your test. Um, if you've already applied and you're waiting on a test date, there's no need to contact the RSA. They will get back to you. There, there may be a waiting list where you are. For example, the Dublin test centres and NACE, for example, are going to have very, very long waiting lists. But down where I am in, in Wexford, the waiting list is not really that long at all. It's probably about 10 or 12 weeks, you know. So it, it there's no... People ask me, what's the waiting list? Like, I don't know. I don't have a clue. One, because the RSA don't tell us anything. They don't communicate with us about anything, whether it's these updates, which I, I research or I get from other instructors, uh, the waiting times. Um, I just I, I just don't know. I, I contact driving instructors I know in Dublin. They might give me their opinions. But in any case, it's very hard to say what the waiting times are because all test centres are different. So in Dublin, you might have a younger population of driving age and the waiting list is probably going to be longer there then it will be in a place like Wexford or Gorey where we don't really have large amounts of 
students, let's say, in third level education. So it all depends on where you are, uh, but it could range from 10 to 12 weeks to up to 16, 20 weeks and beyond, okay? So they will get back to you if you've applied. Just sit tight. They are going to get to you based on when you applied, okay? Because that's the ra that's the way they, they manage the, app the applications. Now, there's no queue skipping. They're not going to be kind of doing you a favor because they know your sec mother's second cousin or anything like that. Uh, they are hoping to launch a waiting time tool that learners will be able to click into their test center and see when they would expect to get a waiting uh, to get a, to get a driving test in the future. But that's not around yet. That's on the way. I believe it's in it's in the development stage. But that will be very very handy, and it'll you know you'll be able to see then uh, how long you will have to wait, give or take, for your driving test. Um. That waiting time tool is expected to be launched once the restrictions have been lifted. So maybe maybe end of September, maybe October, who knows. Um, so the appointments will be given in the following order, as I said in my most recent video. Essential workers who have previously applied uh, for a test during the lockdown. Anyone else then who has had to cancel due to the COVID restrictions. And third then anybody else based on the time that they applied. So if you're an essential worker, you'll be prioritized a bit more. If you have to cancel your test due to the restrictions, you'll be prioritized um, as well, but not as much as the as the first one I mentioned there, essential workers. And anybody else then, if you're like not essential or not frontline, you will be you will get your test date, but it'll be based on when you applied. So if you if you applied six or eight months ago, you can expect to get it a little bit quicker than someone who might have applied two or three months ago. Okay, uh, there is a special form you can fill out on the application journey uh, for frontline workers. So if you're a critical frontline worker, you will be prioritized in the driving test queue. Okay, so you can check that out on the myroadsafety.ie uh, online portal. As I said, there's new testers coming on stream. 40 new testers have been employed and they are hoping to, to employ uh, 40 more all going to plan and they are working longer hours, including Saturdays, so you could you find them doing tests right up until 7 or 8 in the evening, um, as long as daylight permits, and starting very early as well. So they will get through it. Um, they will make some significant dents in the backlog, but just like everything else, it'll just take time. If you want to cancel or reschedule your test, you should go to the myroadsafety.ie um, portal and go to My Bookings, okay? My Bookings. Click on the Reschedule button. Now, if there's no slots, you're going to have to cancel your test then. And once it's cancelled, go to My Goals and follow the links then to apply for a test. Okay, so that's if you if you want to reschedule your driving test. Hopefully, when you click on the reschedule button, you will be able to reschedule and get a date that's a bit more suitable for you. Okay, so that's if you want to do that. Um, if you have any questions or if you want to... A detailed breakdown of the driving test procedure just go to the rsa website www.rsa.ie and then go to it's just on the left um on a laptop go to the, the driving test okay the driving test and click on the faq frequently asked questions and you'll get a list of some of the frequent most frequently asked questions about the driving test about the application process about what's an eligible driver and these type of things so that's a good resource there to answer any of your questions on the driving test the NDLS, that's the National Driver Licensing Service, they say that processing times for new driver licenses and learner permits are three weeks in most cases. Not all cases, but in most cases. So expect three weeks to get your full license or your learner permit if you've applied for any one of those. Okay, And this is due to the high volume of applicants, mostly due to the time of the year as well, because most more people do lessons and <coughs> do driving tests in the summer because a lot of them are students, they're off school and college, and it's a suitable time for them to do it. So it's always going to be a bit busier in the summer compared to the likes of November or December or January, okay? So just be aware of that uh, slight delay there with the NDLS on learner permits and licenses. Uh, on the learner permits, you do have a 10-month extension. So if your learner permit expired between the 1st of March 2020 and the last day of July 2021, you are going to have a 10-month um, extension on that, okay? Check out www.ndls.ie, the website in the blue writing there, and go to the expiry calculator, okay? And you'll get a 
an idea then of when your permit is out of date. If if it has if it says it's out of date on the permit, you may have an extension. Okay, but it all depends on the on when it went out of date originally. Okay, so check out the expiry calculator for the most up to date and accurate information there. Okay, then so that's the the main updates there, folks. Um, I'll get to a few comments there now. I know someone's had a go at the signs there by the looks of it, and then I'm going to give you some tips on hill starts, and I'm also going to go through this report sheet here. Okay, so let's see. Uh, void check there. Number one, he's having a go at the signs here. Uh, number one, no entry. That's correct. Number two, hospital. Yes. Number three, roundabout. Well, yeah, technically it is. And number four, yield, advance warning of, um, what's it, advance warning, normal yield, would have text on it, that's correct, yeah? So number four is advance warning of a yield sign up ahead. So number three is roundabout, but technically it's mini roundabout. Um, it's kind of another sign that you might see maybe in industrial estates or housing estates, or just, it could be anywhere depending on where the local authorities put it. But yeah, it is a roundabout, but technically a mini roundabout. Um, and the advanced yield sign there, as I said, it's just to let you know that there's a yield sign coming up. And this is these are very handy signs, very, very, very useful because if, if you're on a road and it has lots of like ups and downs, like 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 uh, dips and hills and all that, you may actually be blinded from junctions or crossroads up ahead. So it is good to have these, uh, just like the advanced stop sign as well, just to let you know that you can expect a junction further up and it kind of highlights the junction that you don't, you know, suddenly come across it without warning. Okay then, so well done Wojciech, did well there, Doberman Shizna, uh, pretty much 4 out of 4 there. Um, Paul, Pauli, Pauli Mac Mac, yeah. Hi then, thanks for replying to my email. Much appreciated, awaiting to sit my test second time. Failed on the reverse round the corner, clipped the curb, uh, never was shown it. You never did a reverse round the corner, that's, that's surprising. You, you, I mean, if you're getting regular lessons, you should be covering that um maybe the maybe you didn't have time to do it or something like but i'm not sure i mean that's a strange one but uh sorry to hear that um Paul, paulie mcmack um and if you have any other questions feel free to send me another email with the dry with the reversing around the corner you clip the car yeah it's just about timing there maybe you turned too soon or maybe you didn't straighten up enough in time i'm hoping to do some more videos on the reversing around the corner in due course um, it just th those videos take a little bit more time in editing because they're a bit more technical, say, than a video if I'm doing road signs or even these ones here. Uh, the, the the live streams do take a lot of time to prepare, but but it's something I can do on my own with, with the reverse. I need I generally need one other person, but anyway, I'll, uh, that's another story. I'll, I'll hope to do more of them um, over the next few weeks and months. Um, but yeah, if you hit the curb, it's usually down to timing. Practice is the main thing. Some people turn too soon or too fast. I normally say when you're reversing around the corner, <clears throat> when the curb disappears, give it a second or two and then turn. Okay, it's say it should be safe to turn if you give it a second or two, and let it disappear from the side mirror, from your view of of the curb in the side mirror. I mean, and then straightening up. If you're a little bit late straightening up, it's possible that you could hit the curb at a kind of a sort of a forty five degree angle. So, it's all down to timing with the steering wheel there, but um. Hopefully that better look next time. Molder X, hi then. Cannot see this backlog of applicants waiting to do. I cannot see this backlog of applicants waiting to do their tests like myself. The government are going backwards. It's atrocious. Yeah, it's um. You see, Molder, I'm around long enough to. I've been through a couple of these um, excessive waiting lists, and then. They they take on extra testers and open open new test centers and even. There was an outside company doing driving tests in two thousand and eight and two thousand and nine, and it eventually gets gets back to normal. It's kind of like the housing crisis; it goes from one ex a really one extreme to the other. But um, no, they will they will get on top of it. There are new testers, um, and there are new instructors as well coming on coming into the system. So you just have to give it time. You see, um, they're already they're already making a dent in it, and I'd say by the end of the year and early next year. Uh, you'll you'll see some progress, but I can understand your frustration when when you're in the middle of it. It's it's always hard to see a, a clear way out of it. RV, hey then, I have my test coming up and I'm really worried about the reverse around the corner. Is going too wide a fail? Not really, no. But if you go really really wide, and you're practically on the other side of the road too much, and the tester feels you're not in control, and you're not looking behind you enough. 
that could be a fail. It all depends on how bad it is. But please don't think just because you hit the curb or just because you are perceived to have gone wide, don't think of that as a straight fail. You have to keep going. So if you end up going a little bit wide, whatever you do, don't panic. Don't, and I mean this, I I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, want you to listen very carefully to this, just because you're going so wide, don't stare in the mirrors, okay? This is where people get into this kind of a, uh, get into this kind of zone where they're they're kind of looking in the mirrors when they shouldn't be. If you go a bit wide and you're actually looking behind you, over both shoulders, the tester then is is thinking to himself or herself, okay, this chap or this girl is a bit wide, but at least they're kind of observing, um, because they're wide, they're observing for any children or any cars or anything like that. So just keep your composure, keep moving slowly, keep your observation going, don't stare in the mirrors and you can get it back, okay? If you don't panic and do your best to recover the situation, the tester may give you a mark, but he may also be impressed at your ability to keep calm under pressure and to recover the situation. So try, try and remember that sometimes in life, mistakes happen and there's nothing you can do about it. You just have to take it on the chin Hopefully it's only a grade one or grade two, and then move on, you know. Molder X, uh, the waiting times are ever increasing. Um, no, they're not really. Like in Wexford, they're, they're, they've come down a lot in Wexford. Like, like, like yeah, overall, the, the, if, you, if you say overall, maybe in the country, probably they have. Like, but it's it all depends on where you are. Like, I mean, the, the, the volume of people looking to learn to drive and do tests over the summer months after all the lockdowns we've had, is, was always going to be a large number. So there's always going to be a, it's no surprise that there's going to be a, an increase in the waiting times there. Um, but as I said, it's higher population centres like Dublin, Cork, Galway, Nace, those kind of places are, are very busy, very long waiting lists, but eventually the, they will get there and they're going to get there, but it's going to take time like everything. Badra Bachabas, Hope I'm saying that right. Hi then, thank you very much for your video. I passed first time on Friday. That's brilliant. Well done, Badra. And congratulations. So you've proved to be a great driver and uh, glad I was able to help you. Congratulations on your success. Denny, hi Dame. Thanks for replying to my email. No problem. I think it might be a good idea to mention that a supervisor can join you on the test. I was blindsided by this. Yes, I remember that email from... Denny or um, if I'm not sure if that was your name on the email but yeah um, so that's a very good point folks as I said to you um, early in the stream th there's a lot of new testers being employed by the RSA now in the in the driving test system so a lot of those new testers are going to have supervisors coming out with them to make sure that they're doing their job right to offer them support and to offer them guidance so I would say to you don't be surprised, sorry, don't be surprised if you're turning up for your test, especially in Dublin and Cork where the new test centres have, do not be shocked or surprised if there's a second person in the car with you, uh, a second, like a supervisor, let's say, that's not, not, it's not something that you need to worry about too much, but I, I know it can be a, a worrying and a stressful time anyway, but it could be a supervisor with you on the test, this is basically te the tester's boss. And he's there to, or she's there to make sure that everything is going okay, that, that the tester that you have is doing a good job. And it's another set of eyes and another set of ears. So you should be reassured by that. I know that's easier, easy for me to say, but it is very, very possible that you could have a supervisor on your test. It's still rare enough. Like it's not, I, it doesn't happen very often down my way in Wexford, but it, it, it does happen from time to time. And it's all part of the quality control um, mechanism that they have. Okay. Uh, Sean, Sean Jean or Sean Yan, I'm not sure. Hi then, are they still processing essential workers? I applied for it before, then it changed to frontline, which I am. Do I need to process another application as frontline? Thanks, Emil. They haven't said whether you need to do another one as a frontline worker. If you can, you probably should. I, I don't think it'll do any harm for you. Um, but they, the, the, general standard answer from the RSA is that they will get to you if you've applied and you're an essential worker they will get to you but if you're you're also a frontline worker which is a, a, a higher form of essential worker of course these is uh, I would probably fill out that form yes if the system lets you I'm, I'm sure it will and 
that way you should get a driving test date sooner they'll prioritize your application yeah i will i would do that i have a link to that in my last video if you if you want me to send you the link just email me dantai at gmail.com but you'll, you'll be able to find it in the myroadsafety.ie online booking portal anyway okay um rv has a test in four weeks in skibbereen so the best of luck to you rv if you have any questions let me know dantai at gmail.com just take a one road at a time, one junction at a time, one maneuver at a time, okay? And hopefully you'll be fine. But the best of luck to you anyway in your driving test in Skibbereen in beautiful West Cork. So folks, um, about a week ago, someone, uh, a chap emailed me about uh, failing his driving test. Now he subs subsequently passed it. So it goes to show you that even though this t driving test sheet doesn't look like a bed of roses he made some big improvements and then he subsequently passed it then I think it was about three or four weeks later with only, with only four or five grade twos so it is possible that you could have a bad day that you could have been a bit unlucky that the tester maybe being a bit harsh the weather was against you some people were you know pulled out in front of you or something it, it, like and like it is possible to have a bad day so just because you you have like in this test three grade three marks and a lot of grade twos doesn't mean you're a bad driver it might have meant you had a bad hour on the road or a bad 45 minutes but you can recover from it like this individual did here so there was three grade three marks i'm going to go through those now and a few grade twos as well and he was able to tell me what the main grade three ones were okay so um let's see there now you get the information so the grade three on a yield turning right okay so if we go down to kind of about three quarters of the way down there yield right of way turning right the tester gave him a red mark there i think that was the first one he got now this was because he was at some kind of a yellow box junction i don't know if it was traffic lights or not now but it was some kind of a junction with a yellow box now i'm not sure if he was a little bit insecure about the yellow box or what but there was a van coming towards him and he tried to turn right the driving test applicant tried to turn right as the van was coming and it was just too close like the van had to break i don't know if the van beeped the horn or flashes lights or something like that but the van definitely had to break and react to the learner driver pulling to the pulling into the right and the tester gave him a grade three there because the tester deemed that to be dangerous or potentially dangerous okay and i think i mentioned this in the last live stream or the one before you have to be very very careful folks when you're dealing with van drivers okay now if this person was turning right <coughs> And it was a, a little Ford Fiesta or a Nissan Micra coming towards him. He probably would have been okay to take that right turn. But when you're dealing with van drivers, you have to understand, most people in vans, they're probably not the best drivers, okay? They could be tradesmen, like builders or carpenters, something like that. They could be on in a rush to a job. And they're just, you know, they're, they're just going to take chances. They're just going to put the foot down, especially if it's an unmarked van. I mean, if, if it's a marked van, like a, like an Electric Ireland van or or Board Gosh van or something like that, I, you know, I'd say fair enough, they're, they're, they're going to be grand because they're they're kind of identifiable. But if you have an unmarked white van going around the place and you're thinking about going or not going, just be very, very careful because those fellas, they don't hang around, folks. They just don't hang around. So be careful if you're dealing with vans, okay, especially the unmarked ones. Next grade three then was on changing lanes, okay. So he was turning right or changing lanes to the right sorry let's see where's this um the first grade tree near, near the top there okay observation changing lanes okay just kind of the, the third third one from the top here observation changing lanes the tester says and the driving test kind of confirmed it that there was absolutely no right mirror check when he went into a filter lane <clears throat> a filter lane is like a like a special lane for a right turn or a left turn in this case, I think it was a right turn. It's like a protected right turn. So you can kind of go into that lane. There'll be an arrow to the right there. And you can wait in that lane, for example, for your opportunity to go in. And it helps traffic that's going straight to proceed without getting delayed. So there was no mirror check there. Uh, tester said there could have been a cyclist or there could have been a motorbike or a car overtaking you. And you never checked that it was safe to enter the filter lane. So that was what that one was. And the third grade three one then was progress at traffic lights, okay? And the reason he lost a grade three mark on progress at traffic lights, which is 
going too slow in, in, in simple forms. But the reason he lost the mark there was because the filter light was on. Um, the filter light was on to turn right, like the arrow light, and the driving test candidate just didn't see it. Just did not see it at all. And he stayed waiting for a good 20, 30 seconds, whatever it was, and then the tester will, will give you a grade 3 if that's the case. Because that is deemed dangerous, or potentially dangerous, because you might be forcing traffic behind you to become more frustrated, or beep the horn, or they might even overtake you. But it also shows that you're not paying attention that you're having tunnel vision, that you're not using your concentration skills properly. And it doesn't look good if you're at a lights busy or quiet lights uh, and you, you're, not paying, you're not paying enough attention to the lights. Because if you're not paying enough attention to the lights, I mean, what else would you not be paying attention to, okay? So because he didn't see the green filter light, he got a grade 3 mark there. Okay then. The other feedback he got then <coughs> was... It was a grade two mark on the brake there, okay? So where's this foot brake? There's actually, there's actually two two grade twos and a grade one. So on the foot brake, he lost the mark there because he, well, he just braked too hard. I mean, he just, just pressed the brake too hard, didn't read the road ahead. Uh, he thinks it might be linked to a hazard of some type up ahead. For example, a parked car or, 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 or a speed bump or something like that. And... This is where the vehicle controls can be linked to something else, like in this case, hazards like park cars. So if the tester might mark you on hazards, and he actually did get five marks on hazards, as you'll see there anyway. So because he wasn't analyzing the hazards, because he wasn't reading the road ahead, it affected his vehicle controls. So very often hazards and vehicle controls are very much linked. And often if someone gets a lot of marks on hazards, it's quite possible, and it's not unusual to see, quite a few marks on vehicle controls as well like foot brake for example there and he as you can see he has three on foot brake there and five on hazards uh, he also noted that the tester when he stopped the car the, the tester kind of kind of gave a jump forward like like you know like that like a, like a theatrical jump forward and i know i know some testers do this um I, t I to be honest with you yeah it is a little bit theatrical i suppose but you know i don't I don't really mind it. I think it's a kind of a good non-verbal way of communicating with you. I mean, if you see the test doing that, um, just make a note that you're, you know, you need to read the road ahead more. You need to brake more gently. Um, yeah, he's he's kind of he is making a meal of it. I know, but you know, it is what it is. Who cares? You sh you shouldn't be breaking that hard anyway. So, um, progress turning left then. So that's where I'm going to go into this photograph here. Okay. Now the photograph up there on the in the middle of the screen there we have a. a a red car which is the learner driver and we have a blue car which is a different driver and the red car the learner driver is a red car here that I've drawn is wanting to take a left so the tester said to him let's take a left at the lights okay so what the learner driver the mistake the learner driver made was he was worried about stopping in the yellow box so even though the light went green he didn't he didn't follow the road up he didn't follow the black arrows up sorry I have to just charge my battery there. Sorry, folks. I had to. I thought I put my plug my charger. I thought I turned my charger on. I didn't. I don't want the power suddenly going in the middle of a live stream. Anyway, when the light went green, the learner driver in the red car did not proceed through the yellow box to follow the traffic because he was understandably worried that he might get stuck in the yellow box. And because he was holding back the blue car, for example, and and other cars behind the blue car were constantly going and going and going and it took him a while then to, to actually get out of that junction so the tester told him after the test that you should have proceeded when the light went green you should have proceeded because you're only going to let all those cars out who do not have the right of way the light will stay at green long enough for you to make it out of the yellow box especially if you just roll very, very slowly forward. So you can kind of, you know, you could kind of go, use your clutch control and edge forward very, very slowly. And that way, if you're going very, 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 very slow, you're less likely to end up stopping on the yellow box. But he was probably going to, like, even if he did stop on the yellow box, he was going to lose a mark. And he lost the mark for holding back. So you're probably better off just losing the mark for, for showing a bit of progress, like, you know. Now, it wasn't grade three. It was only grade two to the, from what I from what he said wasn't yeah pro progress um, progress yeah it was it was the blue one there on on traffic lights, 
So it's understandable. He was nervous about it. He was, didn't want to stop in the yellow box. But you, at the same time, you can't be too hesitant. You have to make progress there. Uh, because if you don't, if the red car keeps holding back there, the blue car and everybody else behind the blue car are going to think that you're being a good Samaritan and they're going to take their chances because they probably don't know you're on a driving test. Most other drivers out there don't have a clue that you're doing a driving test. They just, they're just they just trying to get where they're going. And if they see a gap, they'll go for it. So that was that. The other feedback then that the tester said was that he was a bit too slow on a roundabout. Um, I think it might have been a mini roundabout. Progress at roundabout. There's three marks there on that actually, yeah. Now, it could have been a mixture of roundabouts, but I think on one of the smaller roundabouts, the driving test candidate was afraid that he wouldn't be able to clear the roundabout, okay? And he was afraid he'd get stuck on the roundabout, and that's why he was hesitant about going. Now, if, if you get stuck on the roundabout, it's actually, it's not really a big deal. As long as you try and keep the, the a part of it clear so that other cars, like, how do I, let me let me explain this properly. So, if you're at a, if you're at a roundabout and you're stopping, okay? Don't go onto the roundabout if you're going to be blocking the area just after the white line. But if you can get halfway onto the roundabout, you should be fine because then the cars can go at the back of your car and you're not blocking them, okay? That's what this learning driver was worried about. Again, an understandable fear, but he kind of took it too far and he ended up losing marks on progress there on the roundabout, unfortunately. And on observation on the turnabout then, he thinks it was for looking down at the gear stick he says he looked around every time he stopped and at the start um but you know it's very possible that he he, he probably didn't and he just just forgot about it or doesn't remember it. he did say he looked down at the gear stick though he he caught himself looking down at the gear stick once or twice and that could be a, a an, an observational mark there um so it's possible you know but it's definitely something to do with looking or not looking around anyway let's go through the driving test report sheet fully now and i'll go through all all the marks and give you an idea of where um, some of the mistakes might have happened, okay, just bear with me. Okay, so the first one there, position turning right and position turning left, first two. So, position turning right, I mean, I mean in simple language, the wrong position on a right turn. Maybe he needed to be more to the right, maybe he was a bit short of the line, maybe he overshot the line, cut the corner, um, didn't go enough into the filter lane. I mean, it, it, there's a whole range of things that could be there on position turning right. Um, usually it's to do with uh, road where there's lots of road markings and you're not kind of over enough on your own side, okay? Something to do with that. Similarly, on position turning left, um, maybe the person didn't keep left enough at a T-junction. Maybe he kind of done a bit of a swan neck by swinging too wide. Maybe clipped the curb on a left turn. Maybe stopped a bit short. Again, maybe went over some road markings they shouldn't have. It's it's all very. It's hard to say exactly, but at least it was only one of each. There wasn't uh, like a lot of marks on this. Um, observation change of lanes we dealt with. Didn't check the mirror going into the filter lane. Observation turning left. So it's it's about it's about moving the head, looking looking left and right both ways. I had a lesson with a girl actually this morning, and when she was coming up to a left turn. She started staring to the right like this. And I was making the point, okay, that's fine. You have a great view of the right, but you're actually creating a huge blind spot here on your left. And if a cyclist or a pedestrian is coming up, and if some pedestrian has their head stuck on the phone and about to cross the road, the footpath, like kind of cross the front of our car, you're not going to see them then, and you could be at fault. So even, even when you're, say, 10 or 15 meters before the, the turn, the left turn, even at that stage, you should you should be doing this. Watch me. See that? Just a little kind of scan left and right. And then when you get to the set the stop line, for example, make sure you don't stare to the right. You have to break it up a little bit and look both ways. And then, you know, as, as you're going, then just kind of give, give like one last look to the right as you're pulling over the line. You'll see that in my observational video. So the main thing on observation when you're turning left or turning right is don't stare the one way too long. Too long. Look both ways. And don't forget the last look, okay? Because if you stare the one way too long, you can easily create lots of blind spots for yourself or lots of blind areas. Next, we have a reaction to hazards. Now, there's five marks here. Now, he didn't go into a whole lot of detail on this. Maybe he didn't remember or he didn't get around to it, but this could be absolutely anything, folks. I always think of... <coughs> I always think of parked cars or cyclists or roadworks in this situation, but equally it could be 
doing ramps too fast. I, mean, I, I know a few people have emailed me and the, the feedback they've got from the tester is that they're either doing the ramps too fast or too slow, most, mostly too fast. Uh, that they're not getting down to second gear uh, for the ramps and they're going, they're hitting them too hard, especially those little ones that, that are, there's some ramps that might look small, but, but, but you really feel a big bump when you hit them. So just bear in mind that I, a, lot, a lot of time you, you can lose a mark here um, for dealing with the ramps in, in an inappropriate way. Um, but mostly it's for not reading the road ahead. So it could be to do with a pothole, a drain, some roadworks, um, very much likely that it was going to be linked to foot brake here as well for braking too hard or braking too late. Um, it could be parked cars, for example, not um, not not kind of dealing with them or not planning ahead with the parked cars. Uh, you know, sw swinging out a bit late, stopping a bit sudden. Um, sometimes a tester will give you a mark here on reaction to hazards if the mark that they're considering giving you doesn't easily slot into one of the other areas, you know? So again, it could be anything, but most likely it's going to be for not reading the road ahead. So for example, if you see a cyclist and they're looking over their shoulder, um, they're probably thinking of a right turn. So if, if the cyclist kind of suddenly pulls to the right, you really should have been expecting that because if you were watching the body language of the cyclist, you could have kind of predicted that that kind of thing might happen. Um, if there's a car, and we'll say a white van, let's say an unmarked white van, because you know how much I love unmarked white vans. So if there's a white van in front of you, unmarked, or sorry, not in front of you, but, but looking to pull out at a junction up ahead, you can be kind of uh, always a bit more wary of that, that they might pull out um, in front of you. They're likely, more likely to pull out in front of you as opposed to the driver of a small car, you know. So hazards could be anything, but more often than not, it's down to not reading the road ahead. Um, having tunnel vision and kind of just failing to kind of see and anticipate the conditions ahead. Progress then is all about driving too slow. Okay, so there's a green mark there for on the straight. I wouldn't worry about the green mark, it's just a minor one. The blue ones there, crossing junctions at roundabouts and at traffic. So we dealt with the two traffic lights ones. So the progress at the traffic lights um, was because the red one, because it didn't, didn't, see a, didn't see the light that was green to make them turn right. And the blue one was, was as you can see in the photo here, the red car held back too much and worried about kind of stopping the yellow box. So it, so the red car held back too much and allowed the blue car to come out. Whereas Tester said he should have went forward into the yellow box. The light would have been green long enough for him to clear the yellow box. Um, but other ones on progress, say for example, crossing junctions. So just, just too slow, too hesitant. I round about as well, a little too slow, a little too hesitant. Just related, related to progress, folks. Um, in a certain way is what gear you wait in at junctions. I always recommend that if you're if you're at or near the top of the queue, you should wait in gear number one. Okay. Do not wait in neutral if you're at or near the top of the queue. It's no point. It just gives you more work to do. Um, it puts more stress and more pressure on you, and you've already got enough pressure and stress with your driving test coming up. So you should wait in first gear. Um, with the handbrake up if you want. Now the, the handbrake is dependent on the hill or the, the, dependent on the how much gravity you have at your side or how much gravity is against you. But if you have the handbrake up and you're waiting in first gear, you can then have your right foot over the accelerator ready to press it when needs be. And you can have your clutch a little bit up, but ready, but not fully up like. And you're waiting in first gear, so you're ready to go then, okay? So if you're waiting in first gear, you're ready to go when the opportunity goes. It's not going to be the one thing that solves all your problems, but it can certainly be a small part that can help you deal with junctions in a better, more effective way. Same with crossing junctions. Maybe, maybe it was a maybe it was a crossroads or something, and the person didn't creep out enough, or he did, didn't edge forward enough, maybe, or just a bit too hesitant. Um, you know, you have to judge other cars as well. Like how fast are they going? Are they vans? They're more likely to go faster. But are they coming down a hill? So if you, if you're at a crossroads and you're looking right. Ask yourself the question, the car that's coming from the right, are they going downhill, are they on the flat, or are they going up a slight hill? Because, you know, whatever the answer is, you can base, base your decision on that then in terms of whether you go or not. So if, if the car on the right is coming, but he's kind of coming up a little bit of a hill, and you feel that he might have to deal with a speed bump as well, well then you could probably 
think about going then if it's safe, if it's if it's practical and safe to go, you could go then. But if, if he's going down a big hill and there's no speed bump and it's a good road surface, well then you probably wouldn't want to be going then. So these are all the things that you can judge as well. But you have to make sure that if you're blinded in any way, like you could be blinded by a hedge or by parked cars or by bushes or something like that, you have to creep out. You have to edge out and give yourself a better view. Lean forward, uh, put your put your chin over the steering wheel and keep the old head moving. You can always let down your window a little bit too and you might be able to, to hear things a bit better too, okay? So that's what progress there. Just too slow, too hesitant um, at some junctions, roundabouts and traffic lights there. Moving down to the clutch and foot brake. So we kind of dealt with the foot brake, just braking too hard, braking too firmly. I've made a great video on how to use the foot brake, folks. Just go, in, go to YouTube, search Dane's High foot brake, and you'll see it come up there. And in that video, I just show you how to brake very softly and very, very gently. But it was probably not so much the technique, because if you're doing a driving test, you probably know how to brake. You're probably well able to brake. Like It's just the lack of planning, the lack of forward thinking is what cost this person I think so because he he wasn't reading the road ahead as much as he could have or as much as he should have it probably led to kind of sudden braking or sudden stopping because of maybe some inexperience or maybe reading things the wrong way so you know it's it could be down to you know pedestrian crossing maybe he didn't see the, the, the there was a pedestrian for example maybe 10 meters from the 10 or 20 meters from the pedestrian crossing as you the driver was about 40 50 meters so that means if you're going 30 kilometers and the pedestrian is is only 10 or 20 meters from the crossing but wants to cross by the time the pedestrian gets to the edge of the crossing you'll probably be at the crossing then so you know did you have time to slow down or or could you have slowed down more maybe he did slow down but he slowed down too much and brake too hard and that's not going to be good for the car behind and it's not going to be good for the tester especially if the tester is doing these theatrical jumps forward so as i said a few moments ago very often Foot brake, marks, foot brake marks are linked to not reading the road ahead, not planning ahead. And the only way to solve that is by getting more practice and getting more driving lessons. And you can you can get over that then. So the yield right of way then. Oh, sorry, the clutch first. First of all, I, I dealt with the foot brake. Clutch, he didn't really say what it was, um, but it's it could have been to do with coasting, which is using the clutch too much. So pressing the clutch in too much, not coming off it. When you go up or down the gears, you have to come off the clutch in order to engage the gears properly. Typical one will be going from third to second. So when you go from third gear to second gear, you're probably going to be braking because you're slowing down anyway. But you have to come off the clutch fully but slowly. If you come off the clutch a little bit too quick or a bit too hasty, it could be a mark against you if the car jerks or jumps. So it's it could be for inappropriate use of the clutch. It could be to do a bit, a bit of rollback as well. Sometimes the tester will mark you here. On clutch if you roll back because you haven't if, if you roll back the car you haven't brought the clutch up enough to prevent that roll back um, but more often than not it's going to be usually something to do with coasting anyway uh, overusing the clutch maybe a bit jerky or a bit hasty coming off it so you have to be a smooth driver you see if you want to have a good chance of passing the test you have to show the tester that you're at that level of efficiency and you have that smoothness that comes with gentle braking and being uh, controlled and professional and gentle when you come off the clutch because the smoother the drive is, the better um, impression you're going to make on the tester. So the right of way, then they pulled across the van and the van had to stop suddenly or slow down suddenly, as I mentioned. Uh, the reverse went pretty well. Um, I think it was a turnabout he mentioned, wasn't it? Yeah, the reverse went pretty well. He got a great one mark on competency. So he might have been a little bit wide or he might have misjudged the curb a little bit. But it was only a grade one mark, so it wasn't really a, a big deal. And the turnabout observation. So the, the main problems on the turnabout with observation are just comes down to not looking okay a, a, a point that I, i'd make here is on the turnabout you don't really need to be looking in your mirrors too much okay yes when you move off at the start it do but the turnabout is 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 a type of maneuver that requires this like a you know full all-round looks because it's a kind of an, you're in a housing estate or an industrial estate of some sort so if you if you keep checking the mirrors you're only going to see a specific area of that housing estate or that industrial estate but when when you look all around you like this you're actually seeing everything that you'd see in the mirrors plus lots more okay so at the start make sure you give a full look around 
a full 360 degree look around and then even as you're going across so you steer fast on the turnabout try not to dry steer so even as you're going across now give a look left and right in the road as you're going across as you're reversing on the turnabout do your five point checks okay so one that's the, the over the left shoulder in the three mirrors two three four and then the other shoulder then that's the five points so you're kind of looking all around as you reverse as well and then at the end or every time you stop whatever whether it's at the start or the end every time you stop make sure you get a full 360 degree look around before you go again and it's very simple if you keep the head moving on the turnabout you're going to cover yourself on observation okay if you freeze and look down at the gear stick you could lose out on observation if you're reversing on the turnabout and you're looking the one way too much that could cost you badly um if you forget to look around it's going to cost you a mark either grade one or grade two so if you keep the head moving you've got a good chance and the final one there is parking observation on parking now i'm not sure he didn't say anything about this so it could have been to do with parking on the left during the test maybe he didn't check the mirror parking and he maybe clipped the curb or got a little bit too close to the curb but I suspect it was at the end of the test when he was parking the car at the end in the driving test centre. I'd say that's what it was. Uh, although I, I'm only I'm only kind of surmising that from emails other people have sent me, um, not necessarily from what this this fella said. But I, I suspect that's what it is. So as he was parking the car, let's say for example he was reverse parking into a bay or something at the end. I suspect that he maybe checked the mirrors too much and he was kind of like like the staring in one of the side mirrors kind of for for the whole nearly the whole time or a lot of the time as he was parking and while that's that's okay in that you'll have a good view of whatever that side is you're creating all this blind spots over here then again if you're reverse parking or any kind of parking well reverse parking anyway you have to be checking behind you over the shoulders the mirrors and the other shoulder as well because if you're at the end of the test like you know you you don't want to lose another mark just as you're practically at the end and i know some people have emailed me about that saying that they acknowledge the lost marks because they were looking the mirrors too much when they were parking instead of looking all around them um and that's what i i, I think it might know but it, it, like i say it could have been from parking during the test like like when he parked before the before the turnabout or before the reverse maybe but i i suspect it was probably ha probably happened at the end anyway this individual managed to make a big 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 improvements and he a couple of weeks i think three, three or four weeks later he passed the test and he did a great drive on passing that test so it just goes to show you although this was not the best drive this was not the best test result he improved a lot he got some lessons did some practice and he did very very well the next day as i always say folks driving is not a destination it's a journey and even when you pass your test there's still lots to learn after that as well okay so i hope that helped you i hope that kind of shed some light on where mistakes happened and i hope you can learn from this as well let's get back to some comments then folks and i will get on to some hill star tips then in about five minutes or so okay i want i just want to find where my last comment was um oh the skibbereen chap yeah rv okay allison hall hi then i have my test tomorrow very worried about picking up too many faults for being too cautious and not making progress yeah so Best of luck to you, Alison, with your test tomorrow. I hope you do well. I hope you pass. But even if you don't, it's not the end of the world. As I said, it's it's part of the journey. It's not an end destination, this thing is. But to pick up on your points about uh, being too cautious and not making progress. Yeah, so I've made a few videos on this. I'd strongly advise you to, to look at those. You have to always avoid um, treating... Or, or, or being too general when you're talking about progress okay because sometimes on some roads you're going to have to drive slow okay you will like like if you look at the photograph here you're not going to drive the red car is not going to drive very fast approaching the lights here if it's busy because he has to keep an eye on the blue car that might pull out and he's also conscious of the yellow box and the light going red up ahead so there's some roads you're going to have to go slow it's a good thing to do but other roads like if it's a good wide open road and it's a good surface and there's no speed bumps or parked cars for example uh, on those roads you should be giving them some juice getting up to 50 kilometers if it's this 50 zone and getting the fourth gear so my advice to you Alison is take each road individually don't think you're worried about being cautious or whatever because you have to be cautious on some roads and you have to be a bit more uh, faster on other roads but 
treat every road individually. Just take it one road at a time. Try not to think of it as one big massive test. Try to think of it as 10 or 20 little mini tests. And then when one road goes well, you can say, well, I passed that, so I, I'm 120 to the way there. And then when, when the next section of road goes well, you can say, well, that went well, I didn't make any mistakes there that I'm aware of. You can say, okay, well, that's, that's 220th of the thing done and dusted and so on. You can build up your confidence that way, okay? So break it down, small little steps, and that can help you, okay? Judge each road individually, and if you're not sure, take it easy. But if it's a good open road and you have the space to pull out, well, then you have to show confidence because... The only way that you can get the tester to show confidence in you is by you having confidence in your own driving, okay? Best of luck anyway, Alison. Gregor2, hello, do you think that it's possible to pass the exam if I can only practice one time every week? Yes, it's possible, but I can't answer that question. I don't know you or your driving ability, but the answer is yes, it is possible. Um, But everybody's different, you know? Everybody's everybody's at a different level so it is certainly possible um i would still advise if you only have time to practice once a week i would make that practice an actual driving lesson rather than practicing on your own like because you could be driving on your own and you could be making mistakes or doing things wrong and you might not be aware that you're doing anything wrong but if you're with a professional driving instructor then he or she is going to make that uh, practice session that you have a lot more uh, worthwhile and a lot more efficient for you okay but best of luck to you with the test anyway Greg R2 Matthew Syriac if I'm saying that correctly passed last Monday well done thanks a million for your videos I made a small PayPal donation of five euros to your PayPal account well thank you very much Matthew I got a new phone recently and I always try and I always try and um, email or text people uh, to thank them so I hope I did say I hope I did email you back um on that my new phone says messages to paypal instead of emails so I, hopefully i got around to you i do i do get in touch with everybody who gives me donations over 10 euro and sometimes i get back to the five euro recipients too but i'm very appreciative of that matthew thank you very much and anybody that's that's donated folks i really appreciate it because it kind of gives me the encouragement to keep going it it gives me the confidence to keep going and making live streams and making videos because I can, it can be a separate income source for me then in relation, and as well as all the other things I do. So really thank you in advance for all your help and support, um, including you, Matthew. And well done again. Congrats on passing. RV, the test I think is he's talking about is next week, but only took four weeks from applying. Thanks, thanks for the advice. Yeah, well, that's, that's, uh, that's what I was saying. It, it, it depends on the test center. So you are saying, if I'm understanding you correctly, that you applied for the test and you have it in four weeks so that's very quick yeah maybe you were i'm not sure if you're dangerous are you a frontline worker or essential worker or something like that but it just goes to show you it depends on the test center some people could be waiting a long time i understand that and i certainly acknowledge that but on some test centers the waiting list is not really that long at all um you know there's there's a lot of a lot of kind of exaggerations and hot air gets said about that with by people who don't really know what they're talking about but um best luck to you anyway rv sarah mac 27 how many grade ones and grade twos can you get well sarah mac 27 the grade ones don't really matter um grade twos if you get nine or more it's a fail but if you get if you get if you get four um on the one type so if you see this person here got five on hazards so that's over four that's a fail and if you get like too many marks on the under one like six or more marks under the one heading that's a fail so if you notice this report sheet here this person got uh five um grade two marks under progress five grade twos under progress so he was just under it there so if he had got six or more he would have failed on progress alone but he failed unfortunately on on, on the red marks he picked up so the the grade ones don't really matter the only way the grade ones matter is that if you take the first one there uh position turning right so if you get one, you can you can get one grade one, you can get two grade ones. You can't get any, you can't get three grade ones because if you do the same thing wrong a third time, there is no space for a grade one. It just automatically evolves into a grade two. So the grade ones don't cause you to fail on their own, but they can evolve into grade twos, which can cause you to fail if you know if that makes sense. But the answer to your question is grade ones don't really count too much unless they are evolving marks, and grade twos nine or more. Uh, but if you get too many under one heading, that's bad news too. Uh, Killian Hartford, 
grade oh, uh, Killian is just uh, kind of uh, repeating what I said there. Grade ones don't affect the result. Grade two is four the same grade. Uh, two false for single, six or more grade two false under the same heading, and nine or more. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, Killian. If I had read that, I wouldn't have had to go into that little speech there. So thank you for that, Killian Hartford. Um, let's see one or two more comments here, folks. Um, and then I'm gonna get to the hill star tips. So Francis, oh, hang on there now, just lost that. Francis Hennigan, yeah. Hi, Dan. My test is just over a week. Um, and my car has developed a rattle sound. Do you think this will make me less likely to pass? Should I use the instructor's car ahead? Um, so Francis Hennigan, it, it all depends on the rattle sound. Probably not. I remember doing uh, lessons or doing a test with a fella a good few years ago now. It was, it was, it was quite a while ago. And he was a bit hardy you now, and he had this old car as well. And it was there was this rattling sound in the steering wheel, actually an old Ford Escort. And the test went ahead fine; it was no problem. But my instinct is that it'll be fine as long as it doesn't affect the overall drive and it doesn't affect the, the quality of of the drive too much. A rattle sound is probably nothing to worry about. But if it's giving you anxiety or if it's making you worry, you're probably better off using the instructor's car then. But if you're going to use the instructor's car, you should. Make sure you get a few lessons in it first so you're comfortable with it. Like you don't want to go in do the doing after only doing one lesson in the instructor's car because you might you might be you know lacking in confidence or not being aware aware of the controls and how the clutch and the, the brake reacts when you use them, you know. So um that's my advice there. It just all depends, mate. Maybe have an maybe have a mechanic look at it and make see if it can be fixed. Maybe that'd be be the best thing. Erica Fleming. I was flashed by another car to proceed when there was an obstruction on both sides of the road. This sounds like a very good question. Do you proceed or sit and wait for them? I came around the bend with a car, with a car on my immediate left part. Let me read that again now. So this is a comment from Erica Fleming. She was flashed by another car to proceed when there was an obstruction on both sides of the road. So I'm just trying to visualize, are you coming from a stop sign or not? I, I, I'll, I'll just pretend you are. Do you proceed or sit and wait for them? Good question. I came around the bend with a car. You were coming around the bend then with a car on my immediate left park. So the answer to that question, Erica, is first of all, it depends on the situation. I'd always say just hold back if you're not sure. But if the other person flashes you, the chances are that it is safe. to. No, I, I say this generally. I'm not. I'm not saying for certain here because it all depends on the situation. But if another person flashes you, it's probably because the other person feels that it's safe for you to go. The other person will probably see bits of the road that you can't see. And he or she is probably trying to do you a favor by flashing you. So if the other person flashes you, it could be okay for you to go. But my advice is don't rush it. Don't just pull out or overtake or pull out the junction, whatever it is, or, 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 or rush around the bend. Do it slowly. Make sure you do all the observation that you would do if he hadn't have flashed you and just take it one step at a time. Uh, it all depends on on the moment there. But I've had that with, with learners many times where I'd say, okay, someone's flashing, that's great. But whatever you do, don't just kind of rush out because he or she is doing a good deed for the day. Um, if you're in any doubt about that, Erica, you should probably just wait and hold back because I would always rather someone lose a mark for being a little bit hesitant uh, probably be only a grade one or grade two whereas if you go and you rush it the worst thing that could happen is probably a straight fail so if you think of both extremes there I'd be always more on the side of being a little bit cautious there for, for the sake of it but it's a good question it, it does depend on the situation yes you could proceed if he flashed you but you have to be very observant and remember just because he flashed you doesn't mean that you suddenly have automatic right of way Okay, it kind of you have to kind of play it by ear, but it's certainly a good question, and it it is one that I'm sure a lot of learners are are are, are kind of uh, asking all right in their in their heads. Uh, Smashy Rashi, Dane, is there any system telling you how long you will be waiting if you applied for a test? Do you know? Not at the moment, Smashy Rashi, but there is one on the way. I am told by uh, information emanating from the RSA that they're they're currently developing. Uh, driving test waiting application uh, of some type so that when you click into it you will be able to get a good estimation of how long you're going to be waiting for a driving test date now I'm told that is going to come in in the coming weeks I haven't got an exact date yet but it is on the way I'll certainly let you know when it does come in 
Uh, they say that it's hope they're hoping to have it in by the time the restrictions are over. So by the time the the you know the restrictions are eased in relation to COVID. So uh, not at the moment, Smashy Rashi, but there is one on the way very very soon, and I think that would be great. I think it'll be very handy to have that for people. I think it'll anything that gives people more information is is always good because information is knowledge and knowledge is power. Let's talk about some hill stars, folks. Then I'm going to get back to these comments. Who's next there? Um, Mark Fogarty there is going to be the next comment. So, um, hill stars. Let's talk about hill stars, okay? So generally, there's kind of three aspects to hills, okay? There's the parking bit, there's the moving off bit, and then there's after you move off, okay? So I have some notes here that I wrote down for you, and I want to give you some tips here on hill stars, okay? Mainly, this will be for, for manual cars. Um, but if you have any questions on automatics, just let me know. So first of all, before the hill start, you'll be asked to park. So make sure that you check your mirrors and indicate when you're parking. On the, it's probably going to be on the left in most cases, okay? So mirrors and indicator, and don't let the indicator go off too early, okay? Sometimes when you steer in and, you, and, you're, going, and you're going to park the car, like, you, you know, you're, you're going in, hang on, where are you? Here you go. And then the wheel might straighten up and then the indicator kind of slips off so don't let the indicator go off too early or you might lose a mark on signal stopping okay so make sure you're indicating there i know if you're in if you're in off the road so if you're if you're kind of off the road you can turn the indicator off but if you find you're kind of stuck out on the road a little bit a little bit like the red car stuck out in the photograph there well then you should leave the indicator on okay uh, another important point when you're stopping on an uphill you should clutch first and then use the brake at the very end because if you brake too much when you're already stopping on an uphill, the car may stop very suddenly, or you may be kind of, you know, you may have a kind of a jolty or an uncomfortable stop. So whenever you're stopping on an uphill, feel free to put the clutch in a little bit sooner. Yes, it is coasting, but coasting on the uphill is no problem. It's coasting on the downhill is where the big problems lie, okay? Um, just make sure the car doesn't roll back as well, because there's often that when you stop on a hill, there's, there's that moment when you're just about to stop, you have to get the brake in in time, so you don't let the car roll back so it can take a bit of practice but whatever you do just try brake so enough in early early enough time that you don't let the car roll back okay also when you're parking on the hill start watch out for driveways the last thing you want to do is block another road or block a driveway on, on in someone's house when you're parking on the hill start also when you're parking as well try and make sure the wheel is straight it's just a little thing but you should have the wheel nice and straight when you're parking and it's going to look good then just it's just it's just a small thing but it's something i always prefer when people finish with the wheel straight that way at least then you know you're you're not going to be taking off at some kind of weird angle another thing then when you're parking make sure your handbrake is up fully okay you have to have the handbrake up fully on the hills don't in my i mean my car still has the manual handbrake where you where you pull it up uh, i know a lot of cars out there have the kind of the the button handbrake the with the p on it part for parking brake you know that's the way the way it's going and Driving is becoming more automated as as time goes on, but if you're using the old style um, traditional handbrake, make sure you pull it up fully with a few extra clicks for good measure. Because you know, as I said, the last thing you want is to roll back on the hill. Now, when you're moving off, then, and just after you've stopped, and or maybe even as you're stopping, try and judge the hill. Okay, some hills are going to be very, very, very slight, whereas some hills are going to nearly feel like they're vertical. Okay. And how much acceleration and how much of a bite you get is dependent on that then, okay? So make sure you judge the hill. And if it's a big, steep hill, you're going to need a bit of extra juice and a higher clutch. But if it's only a slight hill, you're not really going to move off much differently than you would on the flat surface, okay? I always say moving off one, two, three. One, two, three, okay? One gear stick, so go to first gear first. Two indicators, so indicate to the right. And three mirrors. And a blind spot so all three mirrors and good look over your shoulder for the blind spots not not like this now that's not a blind spot a good proper look where you turn turn the shoulder way out here and turn the head properly like that uh to check your blind spot and always remember folks on the hill start or on the flat if it takes you a little bit longer to move off you're going to have to refresh the three mirrors and the blind spot again because if you if you've checked your three mirrors and your blind spot and then you're just you're delayed because a, a, a car suddenly came or, or 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 you're a little bit slow moving off don't forget those three mirrors and the blind spot they've gone completely out of date so you have to refresh them then before you move off okay it's very important you remember that 
Um, don't forget to indicate and check your blind spot, as I said, because sometimes when I see marks on signals moving off, I can often trace it back to moving off on the hill start. So because the person is so concerned or worried about moving off on the hill and not rolling back, they kind of sometimes forget to indicate or they might indicate and they might slip off early. So that's why where the one, two, three comes in. You have to make sure you have some system that's going to help you to remember everything so, so nothing gets left out like the signals. Um, the bite, as I said, you need a strong bite on the, on the bigger hill, maybe less of a bite on the, on the flat. Now, if you're having trouble finding the bite, you have to go somewhere quiet and practice it. And here's a, here's a great tip for you. If you're having a bit of trouble finding the bite, uh, so get your res first, because I always say fact, F-A-C-T, fact. First gear, accelerator, clutch up, and take off, okay? That's fact, F-A-C-T, an acronym. First gear, accelerator, clutch up, and take off. So when you're bringing the clutch up to find the bite, try, if you're having trouble finding the bite, try bring the clutch up a little bit quicker, like that. Don't, don't lift the clutch like this really slow and cumbersome because if you, if you lift the clutch really slow, it's going to be much harder to find the bite, okay? So if you bring the clutch up a little bit quicker, I'm sure you'll be able to find the bite much easier and much more effectively, okay? Um, try not to over rev as well on that. So like I said, just to build on that last point, if you're having a little bit of trouble moving off, don't think that excess revs is the answer. That's probably not going to be the answer. If you find yourself not moving off successfully on a hill start, it's probably down to the fact that you're not properly in gear or you haven't quite found your proper clutch bite, okay? Um, another important point that gets lost a lot of time is make sure when you're moving off that if you have the manual traditional handbrake that you let your handbrake down fully, okay? You have to press the button in fully and down the whole way. On my car, which is an Opel Corsa, Sometimes people let the handbrake down only halfway or three quarters of the way because it's just that type of handbrake that you need the, the button pressed in fully. So make sure it goes down fully because you don't really want to hear this kind of warning sound as you're moving off to say that the handbrake is not down fully. Okay, that's not what you want to hear. So just, just a, that's an important point there. And here's a really important one. As you're moving off then, you should be checking your right side mirror as you're pulling away, even the middle one as well. So as I said to you, it's good. It's a good idea to to kind of you know yeah you, you have to get your three mirrors and blind spot, but even if your three mirrors and blind spot is completely up to date and you're gone then in good time, make sure you just give a few little looks at the right side mirror just as you're moving off. You know that first second or two or three as you're pulling away, a couple of quick glances in the right side mirror is a great idea. There, it's just kind of like your last look. It's like a confirmation look. It's like extra security observation there just to make sure everything is above board and everything is safe when you're moving off, okay? So try get into the habit of that. Even if you've done everything right, just keep an eye on the middle and the right mirror once or twice as you're pulling away, okay? It's a great habit to get into, folks. Okay, and then just after you move off on the hill then, a little bit of extra revs after you move off is, is good because remember, if you're moving off on the hill, you're probably going to be driving up the hill. So you need to give a little bit of extra juice, I'd imagine then if the hill is steep, just so you're showing good progress and so you don't lose marks on progress moving off or progress on the straight, let's say. And when you're, if, you, if you're changing gears on the hill, then don't, don't change gears too early on the hill. Like if, you, if you're moving off on the hill and then you're, you know, you're driving up a hill, you need to give it a bit of extra juice first before you go to second gear. Because if you try to go to second gear too early, the car could easily start to chug or struggle in some way, okay? And as always, finally, when you're coming off the clutch, just come off nice and slowly. You don't want to come off the clutch too quick because whether you're moving off or changing gear, coming off the clutch too quick could lead to jerks and jumps as well and it could lead to an uncomfortable kind of takeoff, okay? So just be wary of that. So I hope those tips will help you the next time you do a hill start. I have a video on that as well. I will leave a link in the description where I go into detail on uh, the bite and what the second bite is. So the second bite is like a stronger bite and I will share with you lots of tips there on how to do a good hill start. Okay then, so let's let's catch up on some comments here then folks. And just the signs up here, um, just so you know, number one is no entry. No entry for, for vehicles. Number two is a hospital sign. Number three is a roundabout, but technically it's a mini roundabout. And number four is an advanced warning of a yield sign, okay? So it's let you know that there's a yield sign or a yield junction coming up, okay? 
So let's get back to the comments then. Um, Mark Fogarty, best tips for roundabouts. Hang on, I don't know where are we gone. Uh, sorry, best tips for roundabouts. Um, is that a is that a question or a statement, Mark? I'm I, I'm gonna presume it's a question. Um, best tips for roundabouts: practice, get lessons, judge the roundabout individually. Um, yield to the right. You know, watch the road markings and signs. Know your 12 o'clock rule. So if the exit is to the right at 12 o'clock, you have to indicate right and use the right lane if it's there. But one of the best things I can say about roundabouts is look at the signs and the markings beforehand uh, because they could tell you what lane you should be in or uh, what exit you're taking or if the 12 o'clock rule applies. Um, but if you are if you want to ask me a more detailed question, Mark, do or you can email me, but I, I'm not... I'm not sure if that's what you're asking or, or what, what you were saying there, but hopefully that helps you a little bit. Rebel Embassy failed my test on Friday as I was just about to exit the roundabout at the third exit. A car appeared adjacent to me on the left and I got a bit flustered and the tester told me to stop. Yeah, well, that's that's interesting. But th is that why you failed? Or is that just something you added in there? I mean, I, I pr I'm guessing that's why you failed, but... You have to ask yourself there, like what, like what mistake did you make? Like, were you going too slow that you allowed that car to catch up on you, or could you have exited in the right lane and he could have exited in the left lane, or or what? Um, but I'm sure that was a bit disconcerting. Yeah, I'm sure that was a bit stressful. All right, I I can certainly imagine. Yeah, yeah. But feel free to fill me in on on uh, on that for down rebel if I'm still online. Um, but yeah, sounds like an unfortunate situation. So sorry, I'm sorry to hear that. But hopefully you can learn from the experience though, and and come back better and more experienced next time. Con H, hi Dan. Oh, it's actually Dane, as in the great Dane. But since it's you, I'll let you away. Do you have to indicate when overtaking parked cars, even if you don't cross the line? No, you don't have to indicate. Um, you see, the thing with the with the parked cars is. Um, in this situation, Con, it's it's much much more important that you are reading the road ahead so that you're you're aware of oncoming cars, that you move out early and gradually for the cars, and you give the required distance, which is usually a door length, and that you're aware of any children that might be crossing or pedestrians that might be hidden behind the cars. They're all far more important than some signal that nobody's going to see anyway, probably. So, no, you don't have to indicate. If you do indicate, just give it a quick flick of the indicator, two or three clicks, you'll be fine. It's not a big deal. It's far more important to be aware of the other things that I mentioned, okay? And you don't have to indicate coming back in because that could be misleading. You could be giving someone the wrong signal that you're parking, for example, or that you're taking a left, okay? But certainly a good question, Con. A question comes up comes up quite a bit. Bento Hamid. Bento Hamid, if I'm saying it right. Hi, how many lessons do I need... Uh, how many lessons do I need to be ready for the exam, beginners? Well, you need at least 12 and probably another 10 or 20 after that. It depends on how you are, Bento, Hamid. It depends on your ability because everybody's different, you see. So the simple answer I can say to you is you have to get your 12 anyway, or, well, 6 if you're if you're under the reduced EDD. Some people don't have to get the 12 to have a full license from another country. So 6 or 12, um, and then after that, maybe another 10, maybe another 15. I, I, I don't know, you see, it all depends on your standard, it all depends on how much practice you get in. It's hard for me to answer that question when I don't know you personally. Michael DC, hi Dan, I passed my test almost a year ago, great, a lot of thanks to you, that's, that's good to hear, and I check back every now and then, but you do great work, it's very much appreciated. I recommend you to my friends. Well, who's that, Michael DC, thank you very much, Michael. I appreciate that, appreciate that support, and I often think when people are following these videos or are tuning in that they become very familiar with me for about three weeks or a month or six weeks, whatever like that, and then they might never never check check the videos out again. So it's good to see someone kind of checks back in every now and then. Uh, so thanks for that, Michael. That's nice to read. And well done to you on passing your test last year. Um, Jordan Devery. No, oh, yes. So no entry number one. Yes, that's right, Jordan. Hospital number two. Yes, the signs, folks. Number three, mini roundabout, good. And early yield sign, advanced warning of a yield sign. Absolutely spot on there, Jordan Devery. That's good job. Mohammed Hijazi, will you explain the big roundabouts with three or four lanes like the ones we see in Dublin, please? Yes, that's hopefully something I would love to get round to 
at some stage. I unfortunately I don't have a lot of big roundabouts in Wexford. Um, there are one or two, but the, but they don't have more than more than two lanes. Down in Waterford, there's a few all right on on the ring road, I suppose down down there maybe, but they wouldn't be the same as the ones in Dublin or Cork, like so. Uh, it's certainly Mohammed a very good idea for a future video, and I would certainly, uh, I certainly wouldn't rule that out yet because it's it's a it's a very good idea, yeah, and it's something I'd love to do. Con again, do you have to check the blind spot when changing lanes? If I don't, will it be a fault? Con, yes and no. You, it is a good idea to check the blind spot. Sorry, one sec. But whatever you do, Con, just make sure you keep checking your mirrors, especially the relevant mirrors. So if you're going to the left lane, make sure you give extra left mirror checks as you're going across and vice versa for the right lane. Now, yes, it is a good idea to check the blind spot when you're changing lanes. But if you're checking the left blind spot, remember, it's just a quick sideway glance like this. See that? Just very quick because you don't want to be taking your eyes off the road too long, okay? And the same on the right, just, just just a quick glance, quick sideway glance, and then get your eyes back on the road then, okay? So yes, it is a good idea to do it, but don't do it if you think it's busy in front of you and it's quiet behind you. But you should do it if it's kind of like busy behind you but quiet in front of you, if that makes sense. So it all depends on, on the situation. But the answer to your question is yes, it is a good idea to check the blind spot. It is the, it is the recommended thing to do. Uh, if you don't check it, it might not be a fault. It depends on the tester. It depends on how busy the situation is. Uh, the tester will use his discretion. But whatever you do, just just make sure you get lots of lots of mirror checks anyway. Okay, moving on then. Um, where are we here? Uh, sorry, Bobble Bobble Beats is it? Can I drive after I pass my test? Uh, no, you have to wait until you get your full license in the post before you can drive on your own and put up the end plates okay now having said that this is ireland after all you know irish solution to an irish problem and all that if you do drive on your own and stick the end plates up before your full license comes in the post i mean i'm i'm pretty sure any garda who stops you will take a flexible approach i can't guarantee that now i'm not i'm not saying that's the way they are but um if you want a technical answer the proper answer bobble beats no you should wait for your full license to arrive before you can drive alone um, after you pass your test okay adam adam what i think what's the average test rate uh not sure what you mean uh pass rate is that what i think pass rate i'm presuming you mean about 50 percent adam what what a, what a great name about 50 percent uh in wexford is 55 percent it's it's very high it's, i think it's near 60 percent or 70 percent some in on in somewhere like clifton or, or ennis or these places on the west but then, if you're in Dublin, it's 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 way way low. It's it's as low as forty or it's as low as it was a forty five percent in Fingus and Churchtown these places in Dublin. So, the simple answer to your question is the average pass rate is fifty percent. It seems to be a little bit higher pass rate on the west coast, but it's much lower in Dublin city. Okay, probably because it's harder, more complicated junctions in the city. Um. Oh yeah. Okay. Got you clarified that, Mister Khan. Hi, Tig. That's interesting. Yeah. How would I know? That filter lights are working as I had a test last week where one signal was green but the signal beside was black and someone from the back gave the horn I was turning right. Well you don't have to wait for the filter light if you're turning right Mr. Khan. If you have a full green light and a full green light is the if you can see my circular light okay so a circular shape. If you have a full circular green light you do not have to wait for the arrow light to come on so i think that might have been a misunderstanding on your part there that you should have you should have moved up into the middle of the junction or even taken the turn um earlier because if it's if it's a full green light you can go anyway you know if that makes sense i like if you check if you check out my video on traffic lights just just type into youtube dane Thai traffic lights or how to turn right at traffic lights you'll see me I, i've explained this many times in 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 multiple different videos about turning right at lights okay and if you're still unsure email me there daintai at gmail.com rebel embassy yes that was that roundabout situation got me a great treat oh yeah when the car turned up on his left adjacent to him as he was exiting the roundabout it's never happened to me before and the tester told me i was supposed to give way to that car who was exiting at the same time um 
I don't know where it appears. Yeah, that can be that can be a stressful situation. All right, yeah, yeah. Um. So yeah, and this is this is why I was saying a few moments ago where the mirrors and a quick blind spot can come in handy if you feel you're in a bit of danger in that situation. So maybe you, if the tester said that it was best to give way there, and that's that's what you should have done. But look, we live and learn, and at least you have the experience of that now anyway. And although it was unfortunate that it happened to you, it's probably less likely to happen in the future to you if that makes sense. Uh, but thanks for clarifying. It was I appreciate you clarifying that. Emma Coin, hey then, when stopping and using the handbrake, should I go into neutral first gear, uh, before handbrake, or should I go in neutral then first gear after handbrake? Uh, when you stop and, and use the handbrake, so you, I do you mean at a stop sign or something or a traffic light or something like that? So, what options are you giving me? Should I go into neutral first gear? Or should I go into neutral first gear after? Oh, sorry, it's usually handbrake first there, Emma Coin. If I'm reading that correctly, so if you stop at a stop sign, or uh, traffic lights or something like that, bring the car to a nice gentle stop. Then first thing is handbrake first, okay, and then wait in first gear. That's what I recommend to do most of the time. Now I'd say handbrake first and then wait in neutral if you're very far back in the queue, like if you're like six or seven or eight cars back. Uh, and then when the when the traffic starts to move, you can kind of stick her into first gear then. But normally handbrake first because it's more secure. You're you're ensuring the car is not going to roll back, and then first gear. In most cases, that that would be the case. I hope that clarifies that, Emma. Thanks for your question. Manish Maharjan, I need to go straight and roundabout, but the lane to go straight is on the right. Should I take the left lane when I go straight on roundabout? Thanks in advance. Uh, if I roll, hang on. You have two questions there. No, you need to take the right-hand lane if the arrows and signs are instructing you to take the right-hand lane, okay? You're telling me that the lane to go straight is on the right. So by that, you must be saying to me that there's a straight arrow in the right-hand lane. So if the road markings are telling you to go into the right-hand lane, you must obey the road markings, okay? Normally, yes, you'd go into the left lane if you're going straight and around it, but if the road markings say otherwise, you must do what the road markings say so in that case it seems like you need to go to the right lane for going straight because that's just the way that roundabout is designed and the same person has another question if i roll back a little bit on the hill start would they mark me for that no no well that yeah they'll probably mark you all right but don't don't think it's going to be a fail run like that you know it might just be a small mark it all depends on how much you roll back so if you roll back a little bit it probably will be a mark but it might only be a small mark, like a grade one, okay? So don't don't lose too much sleep over that. If you make a mistake, whatever hill start or wherever aspect of the driving you make a mistake, just keep your composure, keep focused, and don't give up. Because if you keep at it, the tester can be will probably be impressed at your ability to carry on and recover from any mistakes. Rebel Embassy again, my speed was absolutely fine on that roundabout as well, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's a tricky one, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry to, to hear that. That happened yet um it's just just goes to show you how you have to keep an eye on your mirrors as well um in my, like from what you're say, saying there rebel embassy it sounds to me like you didn't do anything wrong there and the other person was a bit aggressive or a bit hasty and i'm wondering like if i was a tester I, i'm not sure i would have failed you on that I, I i would have said okay there was an incident but it wasn't of your making so i I don't know, maybe, it sounds like you're a bit hard done by there, but I, I don't know the full situation, I don't know, you know, exactly what happened, but I appreciate you clarifying though, thank you for that. Um, okay, folks, I'm going to be finishing up there soon, folks, a couple more comments here then, Emma Coyne says, yes, thanks, oh, I, what was that, I, I know Emma asked the question there on um, stopping and using, oh yeah, the handbrake, so glad I could clarify, Emma, thank you for tuning in. Joy Dip Matey, hi, when turning left from a major road to a minor road, do we wait for the left arrow light to turn green or am I allowed to turn or am I allowed when the straight arrow is green or is safe to do so? Hang on, you're turning left, I presume you're talking about traffic lights here, from a major road to a minor road. Um, well, if you're at traffic lights, it's... It, doesn't really work major or minor but anyway uh do i wait for the left arrow light to turn green or am i allowed when the straight no if, if it's only a straight arrow light you can only go straight so but if, if it's a straight arrow light like pointing up and there's also a circular green light above it or below it well then you can turn left 
but if it's only straight well then you can only go straight okay and emma coin says perfect cheers that's what i'm at. okay great emma thank you glad i could help you out there emma and best wishes to you uh joy dip matey when waiting in traffic if i put my foot on the brake and handbrake will that be a mark no it shouldn't be a mark but there's no need for it though i mean if you have your foot sorry if you have your handbrake up what's the point in having your foot on the foot brake you know i think about it at night time as well if it's at night time the brake lights are going to dazzle the person behind you that that doesn't make sense so if you have your if you have your handbrake up just be away from the foot brake and, and be ready on the accelerator okay it's not that it's a it's not that it's a mark but it, it, it could potentially cause you to be a bit slower moving off and then that could be a mark on progress moving off maybe you know za ali how then should i brake partially or break or press brake close to full on ramps and when wanting to turn to a right or left in a minor road how should i turn using the brake it's all about braking early and gradually there za ali um you see you have to judge the hills so if you can see that the left turn or the right turn you're taking is a steep downhill well then you're going to have to break more progressively and you're going to have to break more over a longer period but if it's more of a flat turn you'll still have to break but break less so the answer is it all depends on, on how much of a hill it is there okay uh, and that's that needs to be the basis of how you judge breaking there mr can would new test center in charlestown have any testers or the same staff from Fingless Center. I don't know, Mr. Khan. I'm not going to answer that with any definitive, in any definitive way. Cause I'm not sure. It could be the case that there could be a new set of testers there, but it's probably going to be a mixture. They could have had some redeployed, because I know in in Wexford, it's not always the same testers. Some of the testers in Wexford go to Gorey, and then they might go to Carlo and then Waterford as well. They kind of rotate around the place, you know. So um, it could be a mixture of existing testers and new testers. But they all they always rotate them anyway. There's not there's not going to be the same testers there all the time, I'm sure. At least that's not normally what happens. Jordan says, thanks, you're very welcome. Jesus, Magus, has has there been times you have clients who had no falls? Yeah, I've had one or two. Uh, very rare though. Yeah, very very rare. I don't really like I don't really like it when someone gets no falls because it can give them a false sense of security, and it can develop overconfidence. But I have had two or three over the years. Yeah, um, and while it's a great achievement, it's it's a great um, it's a great feeling. It's it's, it's good that they pass the test. It could have been just that you know the roads might have been quiet, the tester might have been lenient. You know, there, there might not have been many hazards on the road. It could be at a good time. You know. As I say, it's it's a it's a journey, not a destination. But yeah, it would be very rare to have a blank sheet, very rare. But it can happen if someone is a good driver and and have had a good a good route. Yeah. And Joy Dip says thanks. As does uh, Ali. You're both very welcome, and thank you for tuning in. So, folks, I'm just going to finish up there now. Very, very, very soon. Um, just to just to go through a few bits and pieces there. I'd like to thank this person for sending me in the test sheet. Give me some great feedback. I hope that helped you um to understand some mistakes that happened um and hopefully you can learn from it and uh, the signs there one more time number one no entry number two hospital number three mini roundabout number four advanced warning for a yield sign if you would like to apply for your driving test go to myroadsafety.ie any issues to do with your licensing ndls.ie theory test is there theory test.ie and if you want to email me for any questions or if you'd like me to look at your report sheet and analyze it dane tie at gmail.com in the yellow okay but if you're going to send me a report sheet please give me some information on why you failed or what you think went wrong or what the tester said to you okay i i like when you give me information and i can give you more specific feedback then okay don't forget to give this video a like if you enjoyed it hit that thumbs up button and remember you can subscribe as well for more videos just like this and you can hit the bell notification when you subscribe as well and that way you can be notified whenever i upload a new video okay so i hope you enjoyed this video i'm just going to check any more comments there before i finish um martina should you always keep your handbrake on when you're at traffic lights? it's a good question martina common question um yes most of the time you should see it all depends if you're at traffic lights and you're on the downhill but you're only stopped like two or three seconds. Well, then there's no need for the handbrake then because you can just go. But usually, yeah, you would have the handbrake on at lights because it just gives the car more security. Um, but there's no one simple answer. More often than not, yes, you should have your handbrake at lights, but it's like it's, there's not going to be 100%. That's not going to be the case 100% of the time. Dean Harris is going 
up on the curb a reverse run on the reverse at grade three. It probably is, Dean, yeah. If, if your wheels leave the ground, it's probably going to be a grade three mark there because it's considered dangerous or potentially dangerous, yeah. Some testers might give you the benefit of the doubt, but for the most part, yeah, if you if you mount the curb, it's it's not good news, you know. And Jesus Mega says, thanks, you're very welcome, Jesus Mega. Um, okay, folks, I'm going to sign off there now. I'd like to thank you all very, very much for being with me here. Thanks for your interactions, for your questions. Really appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to wish you all the best of luck with your driving, whether you're learning uh, or whether you're doing a driving test. I'm here to help. If you have any questions, you know where I am. You can comment on any of my videos or you can email me and I will get back to you usually within 24 hours, okay? So best wishes to you all. Stay safe. Thanks for tuning in and goodbye for now.